time to bring in sulfur and talk about the amino acid cysteine, including its ability to get oxidized and form disulfide bridges, so like cross links between regions of proteins or within the same protein. If this happens in a controlled manner, it can do really important things like making our hair curly, or well, really important things like stertifying up proteins and linking together chains of antibodies and insulin and stuff. But if it happens in an uncontrolled manner, not good. And so our body has ways to control the formation of these crosslinks and prevent them unwanted ones from forming using reducing agents like glutathione. In the lab, we don't use that typically. Instead, we use reducing agents like ETT and beta mercaptan ethanol. Yep, cysteine's the reason why you have to add those to your buffers, and especially when you're running like a denaturing SDS page to, to make it so that you remove those crosslinks and are able to actually unfold the proteins before you separate them. Um, but what am I talking about all, with all this? Let's dive in and let me shower you with some facts. This is cysteine. It is one of the amino acids, so the protein letters. There are 20 common genetically encoded proteinogenic ones of these. Basically, there are 20 main ones. And they get linked together into chains um, through these peptide bonds, which fold up to form proteins. And these are going to fold up in different ways, depending on the properties of the individual amino acids. In particular, the properties of their unique side chain or their R group. So all these amino acids have the same generic backbone that allows them to link together, but they also have a unique side chain that sticks off, kind of like charms from a charm bracelet. Um, and these have different compositions and different properties. In the case of cysteine, its side chain is really cool. It actually has a sulfur in it. So it's one of the two amino acids that contain sulfur, the other one being methionine that we'll look at in a couple of days. Now, sulfur is really special because it's kind of like oxygen, but it has special properties. And we'll get more into these later. But these involve allowing it to form kind of weaker, more reversible bonds which is going to allow cysteine to form kind of crosslinks or these disulfide bridges. These bonds between regions of proteins or within the same protein um, through what we call these cysteine bonds. And these are going to help stertify regions of proteins, but they can also be a source of like damage caused by oxidative stress. This can happen in an uncontrolled manner, which can be bad. And so we'll see how our bodies can control for this. Um, but because these bonds are going to be kind of weaker than the normal bonds that we see hooking up all these other things, so thankfully our body has ways we can kind of break these up more easily. Um, and so we can also get these reversible cross-link things um, basically, cysteine is really, really cool. The reasons I'll get into, we call this um, oxidation. And then when we call it breaking up, when it breaks up, we call it reduction. And there's also other forms where it can actually get oxidized by having oxygens added directly to it. Um, and so we'll look at those in a minute, as well as why it's considered redox. But to really understand what's going on, we need to understand why sulfur is making this happen. Um, so sulfur is an element, as is oxygen, and basically these are just different types of atoms. And so atoms are the individual building blocks of elements. Um, and so these include elements include things like carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and sulfur, and we can find them all in this periodic table of elements. Now, in this periodic table of elements, they're going to be um, the numbers that they have and like their arrangement is going to depend on the number of protons they have. So protons are one of the fundamental subatomic particles. So basically these atoms, although they're really tiny, they're made up of these tinier things, protons, neutrons, and electrons. And the protons are positively charged and they hang out with neutral neutrons in this dense central core called the nucleus. And then there are these negatively charged particles called electrons that kind of whiz around them in an electron cloud. We can never know exactly where these electrons are going to be, um, but we can kind of predict where they're most likely to hang out. And we can also organize them in a way that's going to make it easier for us to understand why they react the way that they do. So electrons are the parts of atoms that are typically going to be doing the interacting with other atoms.
And when they interact with other atoms, they have the ability to form what we call covalent bonds. In a covalent bond, basically different atoms kind of sync up, um, they kind of overlap regions of their electron clouds in order to share electrons to form bonds. And they share these electrons to form bonds in order to kind of fulfill their fulfill their desirements to get their desired numbers of electrons and so it's outside the scope of the post but basically each of these atoms the number that you see here this is the atomic number it's going to be its number of protons so each of these is going to have a fixed number of protons but the number of electrons can vary and each of these has like a number of electrons that is like ideal for them and most of the time, this corresponds to having a full outer electron shell. So remember, we can't know exactly where the electrons are, but we can kind of, based on how they react, we can draw this, them as these sort of like onions as a shell model, where basically the electrons that are closer in are going to be held more tightly and be non-reactive. So basically they're held in place because the protons are positively charged and these electrons are negatively charged. The protons are going to keep a pull on those electrons and hold them in place. If you're closer to that nucleus, it's going to be easier for them to be held. But if you're farther away, then these are going to be, have a weaker pull on these. And so these farther away electrons are going to be the valence electrons. And in this shell model, there's like kind of this ideal number where you have a full valence shell of electrons. So remember those furthest away electrons. And you can see that with carbon and nitrogen and oxygen, they're kind of, they have this partly empty shells. Well, most of these have empty shell, partly empty shells. The only ones with the full shell are going to be these noble gases. So the ones in the last column, and they'll have a full outer shell. And when we talk about a full outer shell, in the case of these main elements that we're talking about, it's going to mean having eight electrons in this valence shell. So don't worry too much about that. Just note that these need to, these are missing electrons. Um, in or, like missing, not really missing, but in the form where they have an equal number of protons and electrons and thus are neutral, they don't have a full outer shell. And so in the case of carbon, we have to we would need to get four to get a full outer shell. With nitrogen, we need to get three. And with oxygen and sulfur, we need to get two. And I say oxygen and sulfur because these are both in the same column on the periodic table. These so-called like chalogens, or chalogens, I'm not exactly sure how you pronounce it, but this group six. So this they have six valence electrons. So they would need two to get an outer shell. And so because they both need two, they're going to react in similar ways to get them. And so they can get the one electrons that they need to fill that outer shell by forming bonds to other atoms or by losing or gaining electrons by themselves. And so when atoms link together to form molecules, they do so by forming sharing pairs of electrons. And so they can share a single pair for a single bond or two pairs for a double bond. And if you, you they can also use their lone pairs of electrons in order to form a bond with something that doesn't have any electrons, like a proton. And so oxygen and sulfur, because they're in the same column, they have the same number of valence electrons. And because the number of valence electrons is going to kind of dictate how, what kind of reactions they want to undergo, because they're doing that math, remember, how can I get to that full outer shell? How can I get to that eight? Then they're going to undergo similar reactions. But carbon, so, and so you can find like sulfur analogs are basically sulfur versions of a lot of the common functional groups um, that we see with oxygen. We can swap in a sulfur and have similar functionality. So basically most um, of the molecules that we talk about in biochemistry are organic. So they're based on a carbohydrate, carbohydrate, <laughs> hydrocarbon skeleton. So basically carbons and hydrogens form these skeletons, and then you can kind of have more reactive groups, where instead of having a hydrogen, you have something like an oxygen or a nitrogen, or you have the carbon and the hydrogen hooked up in cool ways that give them special properties. And we call these functional groups. We have a lot, we have functional, our functional groups include things like a hydroxyl or an alcohol group, um, an ester, an ether, 
And with all of these, we can have sulfur versions. Um, so we can have, instead of a hydroxyl group, you have a thiol group. This is sometimes called a mercaptan. This is where, if you see mercapto or sulf um, or thiol, these are basically, if you see that in a chemical name, it's indicating that there's sulfur present. I should mention that, well, as we'll see later, these groups can get deprotonated. These hydroxyl or these sulfhydryl, these thiol groups can get de um deprotonated so basically they can lose that proton um, and become their conjugate base so a hydroxylate group or a thiolate group and as we'll see this the style group is much more likely to do this than the hydroxyl group is this is the group that we're going to see in 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 cysteine we're going to see this style group um, and so cysteine is going to look a lot like the amino acid serine, except it's going to be the sulfur or analog of it. So it's going to have a thiol group. Um, other things you can see, you can see a thioester or a sulfide um, and a thioether. And we'll see these as well because in we see these as these types of bonds as well in biochemistry because these sulfur linkages are going to be more swappable. Um, and so why is this? So basically, as we go down in that periodic table, although they have the same number of valence electrons, sulfur has a whole nother shell of electrons. And so you can see that oxygen had eight electrons um, or eight protons. So remember that this number is the number of protons. And in the neutral form, you have an even number of protons and electrons. Um, but the number of electrons can also vary. Um, but so in its neutral form, oxygen is going to have eight protons, eight electrons. Sulfur would have 16 and 16. And these inner, these electrons basically are adding another shell to that onion. So the valence electrons, the one on the far, the farthest away are going to be the most reactive. And this is still true. But now you're going to have another shell of electrons in between them. And this is going to make them further away from the pole of the nucleus. And because they're further away from that pole of the nucleus, they're going to be kind of like less loyal to the sulfur. They're going to be more weakly held and reactive. Um, and what also happens is that because sulfur is going to have this bigger shell, this bigger, um, this bigger cloud, when it forms bonds, it's kind of like something with a really big hand, like a really, someone with a really big hand, kind of like trying to shake hands with a little tiny baby. Um, it's kind of awkward. And so the bonds that it forms when it tries to overlap its electron cloud with other atoms, those bonds can be weaker and therefore they can be easier to break. Um, and therefore, we can get these kind of reversible linkages to sulfur, things like we see with when we're using CoA groups, like acetyl-CoA. Um, we have we form these thioester bonds that are going to be kind of like breakable. And so they're strong bonds in term in comparison to the sort of just like intermolecular interactions that we see with other amino acids, um, where we have just like partial charge, partial charge attractions. These are actually going to be covalent bonds. So they're bonds, they're sharing electrons, but they're sharing these electrons more weakly than electrons would be shared, say, between a carbon and a hydrogen, or even between a carbon and an oxygen. Having that sulfur is going to make cysteine a strong nucleophile, and it's going to be a weaker base than a, like a serine or a hydroxylate. So what do I mean by this? Basically, by a base, when we talk about a base, we're typically thinking of give something that is able to take a proton. And so pH is a measure of the amount of available protons. So if you have an acidic solution, you have a low pH, you have a lot of protons. And if you have a basic or alkaline solution, you have a high pH and you don't have that many protons. It's kind of confusing that you have like a higher number of protons at a lower pH, but that's because it's this inverse log scale. So basically, if you have a lot of protons around, you're going to have a lower pH and more acidic, not that many protons around, higher pH and less, um, and less acidic, more basic, more alkaline. And why do you have protons floating around? Well, you have protons floating around in part because atoms, some molecules can give and take protons. And one of these is going to be this alcohol or this thiol. So the oxygen and the sulfur, they can give and take electrons. And so if something gives them, or they can give and take protons. If something gives a proton, we call it as an acid. 
And then if something takes a proton, you call it a base. And so you can see that an acid and a base are kind of flip sides of the same coin. Um, so we can call this like the conjugate acid and the conjugate base. So some atoms are much more likely than others to act as an acid and give up a proton. And some are much more likely to act as a base um, and take a proton. In the case of hydroxylate and thiolate, so remember these are the conjugate bases of a thiol and an alcohol, this is going, this hydroxylate is going to be a stronger base than this thiolate. So basically it's going to want to, it's going to be more desperate to get that proton. And so it's going to be less likely to be in this hydroxylate form, more likely to be in this alcohol form. Whereas with a thiolate, it's going to be more likely to actually form in the first place. So you're more likely to deprotonate and you're more likely, um, and it's less likely to like protonate back. So although it's most the most the most deep time in the style form, it can also form the stylate, which is going to allow it to act as a strong nucleophile. And I'll talk more about this in a later post, but basically because sulfhydryl, because the sulfur bond has this bigger cloud, it's better able to spread out that electron density. And so atoms don't really like having a negative charge. So you can see that in this form, when they give up that proton, they have this full outer electrons. So you can't see the electrons here because they're in this bond. But when you see a single bond, that's a shared pair of electrons. And so if you count two, four, six, eight, they have eight electrons, so they have a full outer shell but they also have this negative charge and atoms don't really like having a negative charge. And so this is going, it's better if you can spread out that charge and the sulfur is better able to spread out this charge. So the stylate is more able to form and it's more, and it's stabler. So you're more likely to see the stylate. So bottom line is that this, this um, cysteine side chain is able to deprotonate more easily than if it was a hydroxyl group. So than if it were like serine. And why I'm harping on about this is because the stylate is then going to be reactive and re very reactive as a nucleophile. And so a nucleophile is going to be something with more electrons or electron density than it wants. And in order to get some help kind of sharing that electron density, it's going to seek out an electrophile, which is something that wants more electrons or electron density. So often nucleophiles have a lone pair of electrons. And so this is why I like to draw it as like this NU with this little like smiley face where the lone pair of electrons is gonna be kind of like the eyes of the smiley face and hopefully you remember. Um, and nucleophiles are often, but not always, negatively charged or anionic. And when something is anionic, it typically acts as a stronger nucleophile. And so if something's going to be a stronger nucleophile, it's going to be more reactive and more likely to attack an electrophile if it's unhappier. So the less happy you are, the more likely you are to react in order to try to find a situation that makes you happier. And in the case of having negative charge, that typically makes things unhappy. And so they're going to be a stronger nucleophile. And in the case of like a thiol versus a thiolate or a hydroxyl versus a hydroxylate, when you have that deprotonated form, when you have that negative charge form, that's going to be more reactive. And so if we compare the sulfur and the, the oxygen, remember that the thiol is, thiolate is much more likely to form than that hydroxylate. Um, and so you're much more, so you're more likely to have that more reactive form of the sulfur. And that more reactive form is then going to be out for attack because it doesn't like having that negative charge. So although I said that the negative charge is more tolerated in the case of sulfur, it's still um, going to be reactive. And it's going to react in order to, it's going to react with an electrophile. And we call it a nucleophile because it seeks out kind of the nucleus of another atom because the nucleus is where the positively charged protons are held. And so it's going to seek out um, something that's typically charged, positively charged or partially positively charged uh, because that, that thing is going to want to have, it's gonna have some extra kind of like extra protons it's able to share with this thing that has some extra electrons. Um, and again, we're not necessarily talking about like full numbers here, but it can be partial charges that come from say electronegative atoms. So things that are 
um, basically hogging the shared electron. So oxygen, say, is going to be highly electronegative. It's going to pull away the shared electrons in this carbon-oxygen bond, making this carbon partly positive and thus vulnerable to attack by a nucleophile, such as by a thiolate group. Um, and what what can happen is that when you have a nucleophile attack, you can get a new covalent bond formed. And so this can happen via a substitution reaction, where basically you have a nucleophile attack an electrophile, and now that electrophile is, is like hooked up to too many things, and so something has to get kicked out. And this thing that gets kicked out is called the leaving group. One of the things that we see over and over again in biochemistry is reactions that kind of like activate parts that you want to kick off by adding like a phosphate group, which is going to make it a stronger leaving group. So we're not really going to talk about that too much here, um, but just note that the leaving group is important um, and kind of making a good leaving group is important for making a reaction that's going to be favorable. This is what we call like a nucleophile, kind of like acting as a nucleophile or just like acting um, to build these to build like new things. But a nucleophile can also undergo, it can also attack something to, to form, to steal a base. So it can also act as a base. So a base is kind of like a special form of a nucleophile. And a base is going to steal a proton. It's going to attack a proton. And what happens when you attack a proton is basically the proton is only going to have a proton. And so you can't hook up anything else to it. So unlike those other atoms we looked at, when you have a hydrogen, um, hydrogen is only going to be able to form a single bond. So this hydrogen only has this one electron and it only has that like single shell. So it's this, this little shell, this inner shell can only hold two electrons. So hydrogen can only gain one electron and it can only form one bond. So if you form a bond to hydrogen, it's kind of like a dead end. Whereas if you form a bond to say a carbon, well now there's still other opportunities to have that carbon bound to other things. But with hydrogen, you can kind of only just steal it. You can't bond to it and then have it still bound to something else. So if you want to steal a hydrogen, and if you steal a hydrogen without without the electron, you're just stealing a proton, which is why we call it a um, why we call it a proton. We can refer to a proton as just like an H plus. It's the same thing. So if you just like steal a proton from something that kind of has an extra one, then it's just like a simple deprotonation or endoprotonation. If you have something that is going to be, um, you can also get this thing formed though where you have an elimination reaction where basically a base is going to steal a proton and then the electrons that were used to make that bond to that proton, then they go and they make a double bond and then they kick off a leaving group. So this is another type of reaction that you sometimes see. Um, but bottom line is that in both of these cases, we have a nucleophile that's going to be attacking an electrophile. And so if, and when we ha have it attacking a, when we have it stealing a hydrogen, or when we have it stealing a proton, we call it acting as a base. But that's just a special case of um, of a nucleophile attacking something. And so you can think of like stealing bases um, and building new things. So we typically think of when we say acting as a nucleophile, that's going to be um, acting in one of these substitution reactions typically. Um, and as something's acting as a base, it's just going to be stealing a proton. Okay, so I said all of that, and but there's also another kind of distinction. And so things that are stronger nucleophile aren't necessarily a stronger base um, and vice versa. And part of it has to do with this thing called solvent effects. So solvent effects is basically how the solvent, so that the thing that these molecules are dissolved in. So in the case of biochemistry, we're typically talking about an aqueous or water-based solution. What can happen is that because water is highly polar, it has charged, partially charged regions, it can kind of shield the shield, surround and shield the nucleophilic group. And now if you think about something surrounding and shielding an atom, the bigger the thing that it has to shield, the harder it is to be gonna be to kind of like shield it further. Whereas if something's really small, it's really easy to hide it. So when we looked at oxygen versus sulfur, sulfur was gonna be bigger. And we said that the sulfur 
cloud, the sulfur being bigger was able to met, allow it to spread out that charge density. So it's able to be more stable in that thiolate form. And if it's more stable in that thiolate form, it's less likely to steal a proton. So it's less likely to add it as a base. So the thiolate is going to be a weaker base and therefore the thiol is going to be a stronger acid. So it's more likely to deprotonate. However, once it's deprotonated, now this hydroxylate group, it's easily shielded by the water. Whereas the sulfur, the thiolate, it's going to be bigger. It's going to be harder to shield it with water. And so this is going to be a stronger nucleophile because it's better able to kind of like see what's going on around it. Whereas this guy is all hidden. This guy is more able to... Um, to react with other things. And so it's a stronger nucleophile. And this is because of the solvent effects. One more thing I should mention is that you might think that a carboxylate group would be really nucleophilic. But actually what happens is that this alkoxide ion, so if you have something um, with the hydroxyl group, hydroxylate group, this is gonna be much more nucleophilic. What happens in the case of something like a carboxylate ion, is when you have resonance, you have this electron destabilization, this is going to make it really, really happy. And remember, a happier nucleophile is going to be a weaker nucleophile because it's going to be less likely to react because it's already happy as it is. And so when you have this delocalization, this makes this really, really happy. And so this is why we see that although in these carboxylate ions we have a negative charge, it's going to be less likely to act as a nucleophile um, than you would have for something here. So to summarize, when we have the thiolic group in our in our cysteine, this is going to be more, this thiolate group is going to be more likely to form. So this thiol group is going to act as a stronger acid than a hydroxylate. This means that the thiolate is going to be a stronger, is a, going to be a weaker base than the hydroxylate. So this is going to be more likely to form than this would be. But when this forms, now this is going to be more reactive than this is going to be. And I know that sounds like counterintuitive, but when we're talking about reactivity here, we're not just talking about stealing a proton, we're talking about actually acting as a nucleophile. And so it's more reactive as a nucleophile. And when it's acting as a nucleophile, it can attack an electrophile. And this is an important way that we can form new covalent bonds. So this is how we're going to make it, get it so that we can form with cysteine we're going to be able to form these disulfide bridges. We're going to be able to form links between cysteines and other cysteines, um, as well as between cysteines and other molecules. These crosslinks can form really important functions in proteins. They can allow it so that different chains of proteins can be linked together. We see this in the case of the hormone insulin. We have disulfide crosslinks helping keep chains together as well as in antibodies. So these antibodies are going to, these different chains are gonna be held together by dulcide, disulfide bonds. What these have in common too, is that these are going to be things that are going to be secreted and kind of travel throughout the body and throughout the bloodstream. Now this is important because the sturdification is going to help them with that journey and because the environment outside of cells is going to be more, um, more oxidative, than the environment inside of cells. And what we mean when we have a more oxidative environment, as we'll get into, this makes it more likely for these cysteine bonds to form. So I'm not exactly sure the pronunciation. I kind of just call them both cysteines, but I guess you could say like cysteine and cysteine or cysteine. Basically what happens is that in its normal form, we have a cysteine where we have the sulfhydro group the style group. So we have a sulfur attached to a hydrogen. As we can saw, this can get deprotonated to make a thiol group, thiolate group, which is going to be more reactive. When you have that more reactive group, then you can form these things like crosslinks because you can be attacking an electrophile. When you form these, these disulfide bronze, we call these cysteines or cysteines or whatever, however you want to pronounce it. But basically you have the I instead of the EI. And as we'll see, you can remember this because you're losing an electron and you're losing an E. And so you have E, E, cysteine, cysteine. Yeah, um, that's how I remember it. But these, these disulfide bridges, these cross links. And again, I'll talk in a second about why this is considered oxidation because you're losing electrons. <clears throat> 
Um, although you can't, it's hard to see how you're losing electrons here, you really are, and so we'll get into that. Um, but when you form these cross links, basically you can also break these cross links using reducing agents, such as in our bodies we use like glutathione. And this is going to basically, the more of the reducing environment you have, so like the more glutathione you have, say, the, hard, the more likely you are to break these back up. And so if you were to break these back up, well, then that wouldn't be very helpful if you were trying to use them to make the proteins more sturdy. So outside of the cell, you're not going to have that much glutathione. You're going to have a more oxidative environment that's going to make it so that these crosslinks can stay crosslinks. Inside the cells, however, your cells are going to be very cautious when it comes to having an oxidative environment because this can cause damage. In addition to those controlled crosslinks that we can form, you can also get uncontrolled crosslinks formed and you can have oxygen kind of like um, attack oxygen containing groups and like reactive oxygen species or rocks. Ross, these can kind of inter interact with the cysteine and form things like sulfenic acid and sulfonic acid and sulfonic acid. So we add more and more oxygens. And this can, as you might imagine, affect the functioning of this protein. Um, and so you don't want this to happen in a non-controlled manner. And so inside of cells, the cells maintain a reducing environment by stocking up on that glutathione and stuff and to prevent this from happening. But say you did have those disulfide bonds, well, now that would those would be broken up too. And so you're typically going to find those crosslinks in things that are secreted outside of the cell. So where the where they're more likely to stay, stay in that um, disulfide form. And in order to actually make them in the cell, they're typically made in like special membrane-bound compartments where the reduced where an environment is more conducive to um to their formation. And they're formed in a very controlled manner with the help of various enzymes that kind of like form intermediate bonds to them. Um, and But anyway, why is this called redox? Why is this called oxidation and reduction? So you can remember the mnemonic oil rig. Oxidation is loss of electrons and reduction is gain of electrons. Now, if you look at this, you don't really see electrons being gained or lost, at least like full electrons. Like what it's hard to see what's actually happening, especially in the case when we're full, forming like a disulfide bond. It's like, okay, so I can kind of see here, okay, oxidation and adding oxygen, that makes sense. But here, there's no oxygen I can see. There's no electrons that I can see. What the heck is going on here? And what the heck is going on is that in addition to talking about gaining and losing single electrons, we can talk about gaining and losing electron density. So going back to our idea of how these atoms are sharing, are forming bonds, they're doing so by sharing pairs of electrons and they're doing so by kind of merging their electron clouds. And um, they don't always share fairly. And so some of these atoms are going to be more electronegative. And when we talk about electronegative, they're kind of gonna hog the shared electrons. So if we go back of our idea of the protons kind of pulling, reining in the electrons, if you think of those electrons as being kind of like dogs, that these protons are dog walkers. The further away dogs, remember those are the valence electrons. These are going to be the hyper dogs that are kind of like reactive and trying to run away. And the further they are away, the more reactive they're going to be and the less tightly held. And so in the case of sulfur, remember they're farther away, they're going to be less loyal. Um, the closer they are, the more tightly they're going to be held. And also the more protons there are, the more tightly they're going to be held. And so as you go, as you get up here in the periodic table, as you get up in the periodic table, you have these closer held electrons. They're going to be more tightly held. And as you go to the right of the table, you're going to get these electrons are going to be, um, there's going to be more protons. And so there's going to be a stronger pulling power. And so if we look at oxygen and we look at sulfur, well, sulfur is going to be below oxygen. So it's going to have its electrons further away. So it's going to be less tightly held. And if they're less tightly held, well, then they're going, it's going to be less electronegative. And so electronegativity is like the measure of the pulling power. And so who's going to win? If you had a sulfur bond to an oxygen, oxygen is going to win. They're going to kind of if you were to split them up, we're not saying we're going to do it, but if you were to split them up, who would get to keep the electrons in that bond? The oxygen would. 
And so we call we say that when sulfur is bound to oxygen, it's like oxygen is stealing electrons because it's kind of hogging the electrons that they share. So when they merge up their clouds, the oxygen doesn't just have a tighter pull over its own electrons, it has a tighter pull over those new electrons that it actually shared. And so when you form a bond to an oxygen, you're going to be oxidized, you're going to be losing electron density. So this is true in the case of sulfur, and it's also true in the case of like carbon, in the case of hydrogen, in the case of nitrogen. Oxygen is going to be more electronegative than these things, and so if you form a bond to oxygen, it's like you're losing electron density, and so oxidation is going to be the loss of electrons, and we see oxidation, sometimes it's accompanied by a formation of a bond to oxygen, but not necessarily. And sometimes it's accompanied um, in, in, the, in, the, in the other direction, we have reduction, which is the gain of electron density. So if you think about, okay, well, maybe if, you, if you're bound to oxygen, that's kind of like you don't get those electrons. So if you lose a bond to oxygen, well, now you're probably more likely to get electrons. So if you form a bond to something else, you're more likely to get electrons. And so if you were to swap out a bond to an oxygen to say a bond to a hydrogen, well, when I bond to a hydrogen, that's like a free electron because hydrogen only has that single proton. It's not able to hold on to it very well. And so if they were to split up, well, now you would kind of get that electron. You would get that, um, that electron. And so that would be kind of like you were getting a free electron um, and rig reduction is gain. So that would, when you have reduction, it's often but not always accompanied by the gain of a bond to a hydrogen. And I should mention that we need to be careful when we're talking about the gain of a bond to hydrogen. When we talk about oxidation or reduction, we can be, sometimes this involves a bond to a hydrogen, but that's not the same as the bond to a proton. And so, or in terms of like this redox, like the change in a bond to a hydrogen versus the change in a bond to a proton. So when you have a proton, that's just a, that's just a proton. There's like no, there's no electron involved here. And so if, for redox, we need to have electrons involved. If you're just gaining a proton, if you're just gaining a, a, the hydrogen's kind of like the hydrogen's proton, but not its electron, then it's just going to be a deprotonation reaction. There's no redox involved. So these are going to have the same oxidation state. The thiol and the thiolate, there is no difference in their oxidation state. So the deprotonation is not a redox reaction. But when you form these disulfide bridges, this is a redox reaction. Or when you form a bond to oxygen, this is going to be a redox reaction. So we saw why oxygen was. Well, what about the sulfur? Well, here we don't have oxygen involved, but the sulfur is still going to be more electronegative than, say, the hydrogen. And so when we talked about the hydrogen, remember that only had that single proton. It couldn't hold on very well. But in the case of the sulfur, that's going to have that's going to have a tighter pull. It's going to be more electronegative. And so if you have something that's you're bound to something that's more electronegative, it's going to be pulling things away. And so although it's not pulling as strongly as if you were bound to an oxygen, it's still bound, pulling more strongly than if you were bound to a hydrogen. And so when you have one of these disulfide bonds form, you're being oxidized compared to what you were in this thiol form or in this thiolate form. So remember, these are the same oxidation state, but this is going to be a higher oxidation state because you're going to be now having to share those electrons more with the cysteine, so it's with the other sulfur. So it's like you're losing electron density. So deprotonation, not a redox reaction, but oxidation and reduction, this is a redox reaction. And then you want this to happen in a controlled manner so that you don't have problems um, problems for. But what if it happens in an uncontrolled manner? If it happens in an uncontrolled manner, thankfully our bodies have ways you can compensate. And so they can prevent it from happening in the first place, but they can also kind of break them up when they do form. And so, as I mentioned, when you have bonds to sulfur, those are going to be more easy to break because sulfur's got that those big clouds that are kind of like, kind of like the dice one in the movie. I have a big head and tiny little arms, or whatever the the those quote is. Um, but basically, it um is going to make really awkward bonds, and so or more awkward, um, looser bonds. And so these are going to be easier to break up. And they're typically broken up in a thiol disulfide exchange reaction. But a similar thing can happen in this direction where you want to form these. 
And so if you were to say, just like have this thiol group, even if you were to deprotonate it, it's still really unlikely to just attack this sulfur group because this hydrogen is going to be a poor leaving group. So remember when I talked about like something acting as a nucleophile to form a new bond and how you have to kick something off? And the, the more likely that thing, the more happier that thing is like to be kicked off, the, ha the more likely this reaction is going to be to happen. And it's really unlikely that you're just going to kick off that proton. Um, and the sulfur wouldn't be a very good, um, this sulfur is not going to be very electrophilic because, well, it's kind of gotten the electrons, it's getting those electrons that it was stolen from this hydrogen that are stealing, it's stealing these electrons from this hydrogen. So it's not getting the electrons pulled away from it. It's getting kind of, to keep these electrons. So it's pretty happy as it is. But um, so to make it more reactive, what often happens is that you form an intermediate where you attack you link something else onto here. Um, and so you have this group is going to attack another group. You kind of get this intermediate that then serves as a better leaving group to get kicked off. And often this is involving different like thiol disulfide exchange reactions. So when you look at a reducing agent, when you look at something like DTT, or if you look at one of the groups, the oxidizing groups that's going to actually go in the other direction, you would have something like this where you have a disulfide bridge attacking um, with uh, reacting with something with these thiol groups. What's going to happen is that you can have these uh, kind of form these sulfur sulfur crosslinks between two different molecules. So between the reducing agent or between the oxidizing agent and the and the thing that's going to be crosslinked. You have one thing that has a crosslink already and one thing that doesn't. And you're going to kind of swap which ones has the crosslinks. So you're going from, in this case, what you're doing is you're going from a protein that has a crosslink and a reducing agent that doesn't have a crosslink to a reducing agent that has a crosslink and the protein that doesn't have a crosslink. And now, of course, this reducing agent is now an oxidizing agent because just as base and acid were flip sides of the same coin, a reducing and an oxidizing agent are flip sides of the same coin. When something is reduced, it gains electrons and now it can give those electrons. So it can now act as an oxidizing agent um, and vice versa. And so we can go kind of back and forth between having crosslinks on one thing and crosslinks on another thing with one thing acting as the reducing agent, one thing acting as the oxidant, and it can get kind of confusing. Um, but the key thing to remember is that if you see a disulfide bridge, so if you see an SS, you can then you can break that up. When we break that up, we call that reduction and you can reform it and we call that oxidation. So the key thing about sulfur, remember, is those bonds are going to be weaker so you can make and break them and make and break them and make and break them. And often you're make and breaking and make and breaking and making and breaking them with something else that has sulfurs. And so you can call it, we call these like these thiol disulfide exchange reactions. They can happen just with like free floating, reducing or oxidizing agents. Um, things like in the lab, DTT, or in our bodies, glutathione, um, which is made up of cysteine and glutamate and glycine. So it has these sulfurs that can form these disulfide bridges that can then get broken up and then remade and then broken up and then remade and then broken up and then remade and then broken up and then remade. Um, or in different proteins that are kind of going to have these disulfide bonds that can get made and broken and made and broken in order to form these crosslinks in this more in this more controlled manner. And so in our in the lab, we often use a chemical like DTT or beta mercaptoethanol or TSEP. Um, and so what you can see is that these have in common, well these two, um, these three, is that they have, or these um, four, they have these sulfur groups. Or the, yeah, these two, sorry. <laughs> they have these sulfur groups and these sulfur groups are going to be able to form those crosslinks that then can be broken and then can get made and then can get broken. Um, but typically when we're just using them in the lab, they're only getting, um, their crosslinks are just going to get made and then they kind of get spent. So we have to keep adding more if you were to, you don't want it to be like held in, they're gonna go bad basically over time and they can get used up. But in our bodies, we have ways that we can kind of recycle this glutathione with other proteins that we'll look at later, uh, but to reform, to remake these. Um, to break up these, so basically to reduce it back into this form where you have these SH groups that can then serve to attack those crosslinks and break them up. Um, and so 
this is how your body can control where those crosslinks form. And these crosslinks can play important roles in keeping together chains of proteins, certifying regions of proteins so they can form in between individual protein inside of individual proteins or between um, different proteins. And this can affect how these proteins would run if you were to try to separate them by size in a gel. So like an SDS page gel. The SDS, um, this stands for sodium dodecyl sulfate. Um, and so sulfate here, but here the sulfate is just going to be, um, so we have sulfur here, but it's basically just in the sulfate. That's going to make this negatively charged. That's going to allow it to coat proteins with a negative charge. That's going to allow you to use electricity to send them traveling through a gel towards a positive charge. And they're going to get tangled up in the gel as they travel. And the longer they are, the more tangled they are going to get. And so they're going to travel more slowly. And so when you turn off the electricity, you turn off that charge, they're going to be higher up in your gel. So what happens with the SDS is it's not just negatively charged, it's also detergent. So it can kind of unfold the proteins, especially with the help of some heat. But heat and detergent, those aren't going to break up those crosslinks. It'll unfold just kind of the shape of the protein that's just made by those attractions, but not by the crosslinks that are actually formed. And so what happens here is that in order to break up those crosslinks, you have to add a reducing agent. So often in a loading buffer, we add like DTT or we add BME. Um, typically we add BME to the loading buffer. Um, and so often what we do is we have it pre-made and then we kind of like add BME and then we keep the stock of it with BME in the freezer. And then we keep the stock without BME in the, just like the at room temp and then we can add BME when we need a new, um, a new portion. Um, and depending on whether or not your protein actually has disulfide bonds, or has a possibility to form disulfide bonds, you have to be more careful about whether or not um, the BME is like still good, still fresh. Um, sometimes it's helpful to actually leave out the BME though, if you want to see if your protein maybe forms multiple forms, um, like multimers. So sometimes we can have multimers form from basically a multimers when you have multiple proteins or multiple copies of a protein that are kind of stuck together. Often they're just stuck together through those non-covalent bonds. So just through attractions, like charge-based attractions and things like that. But they can also be formed through disulfide bronze through those crosslinks. If you leave out the BME, if you leave out the reducing agent, those would still be able to be held. And so your protein is going to be, would travel as if it were so if it was a big complex because it still is, um, you haven't broken up that complex. And so when we run a native page, so if you run it under like denaturing, de non-denaturing conditions, then you can see that the protein is going to be higher up. You can also though, when we talk about naturing and like you can also talk about naturing um, and reducing, denaturing and reducing. And so typically when we talk about denaturing gel, we're talking about denaturing and producing agent with and producing. Um, but sometimes you can also just do like denaturing where you don't add the BME, but you do add the heat and the detergent. Um, what would happen here is that if you have a cross link that would still be held together, um, even though you're unfolding the proteins. Um, and you can also though have crosslinks that can confuse things because those crosslinks can form inside of individual proteins rather than between proteins. And this would impact the protein shape, um, but not necessarily like if it's not making it stuck to other things, but it could still affect how it runs. So basically bottom line, be careful. And most of the time you're gonna be adding a reducing agent. Another time you might add a reducing agent is when you go to the hairstyler. And so basically the protein keratin, it has a lot of cysteine and the cysteine can form crosslinks in between kind of like strands of hair or between in the proteins inside of the hair. Um, and so basically you have these strands of protein inside of the strands of your hair um, and these keratin, this keratin protein, and it has a lot of these sulfurs and these can form crosslinks between different strands. And remember, we can make and break those crosslinks by adding or removing reducing agents. So, so adding redu reducing agents if we want to break things up, adding an oxidizing agent if we want to form those crosslinks. So remember, when you're forming a crosslink, you're losing electron density because you're swapping a bond to a hydrogen to a bond to a sulfur. The sulfur is going to be more electronegative, so it's going to hog more of the electrons. So it's like you're losing electrons. You're gaining a bond to a hydrogen, 
Um, hydrogen is like having a free electron because it only has a single proton. It can't keep hold over that proton very well, so the sulfur can kind of like own it when it bonds to a hydrogen. And so when you add a reducing agent, you're going to break this up. When you add an oxidizing agent, you would make this. And why this matters is that in your hair, where those bonds form is going to dictate how your hair is held, like the shape of your hair. And so you can imagine if these strands are all like kinked up, you would have it so that you would have like shorter hair, the cross links would hold it tighter together. Whereas if you then reform those in a different way, you could have the hair be held in a different shape. So more or less curly. And so what happens in like a perm is that you can kind of break those bonds if you don't like the bonds that are formed and then kind of like curl it around curlers and then add an oxidizing agent to reform, reform the cross links in a different different way because remember these cross links are kind of like swappable so you can make cross links between different areas of protein so you can swap which pro which cross links were formed um and humidity can also affect um your hair curliness because not only do you have those cross links but you also have hydrogen bonds so these are basically charge-based attractions between the different strands um, and water will actually mess with those, although they won't affect the actual crosslinks. And so you can get your hair to kind of temporarily change shape, but not permanently. So that was the basics of cysteine, and it all comes down to it's having a sulfur instead of uh, oxygen. And the sulfur is going to make it so that this vial group is going to be easier to deprotonate than a hydroxyl group. So you're more likely to find it in the thiolate form, and this thiolate form is more likely to act as a nucleophile. So it's going to attack an electrophile and form a to form a new bond, or and this can make it so that you can form new bonds between different sulfurs. You can get sulfur sulfur crosslinks or disulfide bonds that can make regions of protein sturdier, attack different attach different protein chains together. All sorts of great things, but if this happens in an uncontrolled manner, then it can cause problems. And so that's why your body maintains a strict reducing environment using things like glutathione to break up any wrong cross links that form um, and help and have proteins that help promote the formation of the cross links that you do want to form. And so all of this has to do with so cysteine having a sulfur, which is bigger than oxygen, but reacts fairly similar. So you can get oxygen -y, um, sulfur analogs of oxygen like functional groups. Um, but these sulfur analogs are going to be easier to um, kind of like easier to make and break. And so this makes it helpful if you want bonds that are kind of more permanent than just attractions, but less permanent than like other covalent bonds. So sulfur is really great for that because of its big size and it's kind of like not weak ability to form to form those stronger bonds. In addition to crosslinks and proteins, we can also see this come into play when we look at groups like acetyl-CoA. Um, and so basically here you have a thioester linkage that's going to allow this CoA, this vitamin derived um, helper molecule to kind of pass groups off from one thing to another. Um, and so much more on that in other posts, but you have this thioester linker that's really important for being able to swap out the thing that is here. So that wasn't cysteine, um, that was just, but it did have a sulfur. Cysteine is one of the two amino acids that has a sulfur. We'll look at methionine in a couple days. Methionine has a sulfur, but it's much different. It's a thioether. Well, I mean, it's the same sul type of, sul it's a sulfur, but it's in a different form. It's in this thioether form where it's surrounded by these carbons. And so this breakability of the spawn is gonna come in really handy but it's not going to be able to act in the same way as cysteine. Um, you're not gonna like deprotonate it to form a thiolate or anything like that. And you're not gonna get these cross links formed, but you are going to be able to kind of swap this, this methyl group from one thing to another. So sulfur is gonna come into play in a couple of days um, in the case of methionine, but for now that was cysteine and I hope you helped you understand it.